All right, guys, so uh, awesome, cool. So we just had to restart my phone. Um, so thanks for coming back. Um, hey, John, I just spent the last hour talking about uh, CRLS, so these little reflectors that I've been using in uh, my work. Um, hey, guy, hey, like, I'm assuming it's uh, Jacob. Hey, Jacob. Uh, yeah, so thanks if you're rejoining. If you were with me for the last hour, thanks for coming back. Uh, I totally mismanaged my hour. I can't believe how fast everything went. Um, I also apologize if I didn't get to some of your questions. Um, the video is should be saved to my story, so I'm, I'm going to personally go back and watch it and look through the comments. So maybe what I'll do now is more of a Q&A. If anyone has any questions of what I sort of talked about in the last hour, I'm also happy to go back to um, go back to the demo part of it so I can launch that double screen thing again if anyone wants to look at that again. I um, want to kind of try to make this interactive um, and really kind of answer your questions from the perspective of being a user of CRLS and using reflected light. So, we have a bunch of people coming coming back. So again, if you, uh, <coughs> oh, so are the reflectors color-coded, Hugh asked. Yes, they are color-coded. So I will, let me go grab what I have. Okay, so the question was, so he asked, are, there, are the reflectors color-coded? So yes, they are color-coded. So if you get, um, if you, if you get um, Lightbridge's bags, um, they are kind of color-coded in the bag. So there's white, purple, blue, and black. So uh, your number one is going to be black, your number two is going to be blue, your number three is going to be purple, and your number four is going to be uh, white and they are actually color coded on the reflector themselves. So blue for number two, um, uh, black for number one, uh, purple for number three, or violet, I guess, more specifically, and uh, the white is an, a number four. So the last couple of questions we're asking to demo, uh, so Billy was asking, the last couple of questions were asking to demo multi -reflector, multiple reflectors in one stream of light. Right, got it. So yes, I can absolutely demo that. So let me launch, let me go ahead and launch the second screen again. So let me invite myself. Uh, one sec. Okay, so uh, let me join myself. Let myself introduce myself. So there's also a question here uh, in terms of uh, key light. Oh, sorry, let me flip this one around. Uh, so the question was, uh, in terms of key light, is the 50 by big enough as a source compared to a light mat? So again, uh, the question came up earlier about um, size of the reflector and its softness. So again, um, these reflectors are still abiding by the laws of physics. So the, the, the larger the source is, any source, whether these reflectors, whether it's a light mat, whether it's a 650 with some diffusion on the doors, whether it's a eight by blanket light, the larger the source, the more wrap that source is gonna be, have, and therefore it's going to be softer. So the specific question from um, FB Camp, uh, sorry, I'm not saying that right, uh, is, is a 50 by big enough compared to a light mat? So 
my returning question would be what size light mat? So light, light gear does make a light mat. They make a, um, uh, not the two L, but there's a, there's a, a variation of the two L that is instead of long is, is more like a square, like a two by two basically. So if you're talking about that particular light mat, then, you know, that's about two by two, 50 by 50 is almost two by two quality might be, you know, similar. Um, if you're talking about like a light mat four, which is much larger, I would say that the light mat is probably going to have more wrap because it's, it's just bigger. Um, so, uh, feel free to chime in, uh, with more details, uh, and I can elaborate further. Um, so going back to Billy's comment. Yeah. So people want to see kind of multiple reflectors in the same beam. And for me personally, this is kind of where it gets really exciting because um, uh, it's so efficient. Like, you know, like most of the tabletop work I'm doing now, I'm doing with two lights. And the second light is only coming through a big, like eight by for a bit of fill. And often I'm making that fill a little cooler, um, but everything else I'm doing with like one aperture light with a, with a, the spotlight mount and like sometimes like seven or eight reflectors in that same beam. Um, I actually have a, a, a BTS photo on my Instagram um, of a food shoot that I did. Um, and you can sort of see that. Um, so yes. And I also, you know, I think for me also, that's also from a, from a, an aesthetic standpoint is uh, what makes the system so um realistic in terms of like the, the result. Um, you know, sunlight is, uh, you know, I think what you can do with that by having multiple reflectors in the same light is you can start to zone that light. And to me, aesthetically, that's what sunlight looks like. Um, you know, sunlight is, is rarely, certainly like uh, daylight interiors, is generally not a single swath of light. You know, it's coming into a space, and as it comes into that space, uh, you know, it's getting, uh, well, A, it's bouncing around everywhere, but it's also like different surfaces, but it's also, you know, like in this space that I live in, uh, you know, I've got some pillars and some other, you know, and the windows and the blinds and, and, and these other like physical things in, in, the, in the path of the light that it's kind of breaking up that light. And so, um, and even even outside of my place, like, you know, if, as the sun drops below the horizon and dips, you know, into a tree or dips into another building, you know, that light is broken up as it comes into my own space. And so it's not just the swath of light, it's these like zones of splashes kind of everywhere. And what I like about the system is, especially with tabletop, is I can take the light, one source, create this like stream of light, which is what I sort of used as a metaphor earlier, and what I've heard as being used as a metaphor, and just take these reflectors and put them into the single beam of light that I've set up and redirect it into the scene, into this tabletop scene that I'm lighting. Um, so the uh, question is, uh, what lamp am I using and what approximate light loss do I have from the different panels? So again, uh, when I first got started, I was using mainly uh, Fresnel's uh, Aperture 120Ds uh, and their Fresnel that they make for that lamp. Um, but then um, since Aperture released their spotlight mount uh, for the same light, uh, I've gotten to that and that's kind of what I'm using now. And then more recently, I've also started using the Dado stuff with the parallel beam adapters, uh, which are incredibly uh, efficient in terms of, uh, or you know, making that small little light uh, punch way above its weight. In terms of light loss, I I couldn't tell you exactly how much light is being lost on each reflector. Um, I've got a meter here, so we can look at it. Um, but you're also talking about um, fall off at that point, so you know. I can give you measurements at a certain distance, but over greater distances, the differences between a one and a two and a two and a three and a three and a one and a four and a one are gonna change uh, just because of you know the inverse square law. Um, 
am uh so some people can't hang out for the whole stream am i going to add this to my highlights afterwards yes i am so if you missed the first hour um i actually started at 3 p.m eastern standard time uh and the, the hour just flew by and so i've just started this uh second round uh but the first round is already posted uh and the second round i will post as well uh so hi everyone again um if you're rejoining us uh thank you for coming back uh hopefully if you were part of the first session you got something out of it um <laughs> how many walnuts can i light with a 15 by reflector number one all of them um cool so sorry so billy i keep going off on a tangent here so everyone wants to see i think multiple reflectors in the same light stream so um let me go ahead and do that so we'll put in uh i'm going to flip this around and again i apologize if i miss your question i will try to come back before the next hour um uh, is up and address your questions okay so uh okay so looking at multiple so what i what i'll typically do with a tabletop scene is start with one reflector as a base light um depending on how much i'm photographing i will it'll either be a 25 by sometimes it'll be a 50 by rarely for tabletop am i going to a 50 by I'll start even at 25 by I'm not really doing uh, because I'm the field of view of what I'm shooting is so small um, and I because I want to create that zoning effect generally um, I'm using smaller reflectors because the bigger the reflector the more spread it's going to have and I'm I'm generally trying to avoid that swath of light feeling I'm trying to create these like this zone of light so um, so for the sake of argument, let's start with uh, let's start with a number three. So we'll put a number three in here. And actually, you know what? We're gonna go. We'll go to. We'll actually go to a twenty-five by number three. And just uh, so everyone knows, there is a little hole that they put in the reflectors that you should put a safety chain in here, uh, so it doesn't does fall it's not gonna smash on the ground uh, for the sake of this I won't do that but just so you know there is a little hole there for uh, a safety chain which they actually do include um, once you buy the upgrade kit okay so here we have a number three kind of as a base light and then again what's kind of exciting is when you can start putting uh, other reflectors into the same beam. So I'll take another C stand here. Carefully. And again, if you were part of the first session, what I'm what I'm typically doing is like playing shadow puppets here. So you know this is a pretty wide beam, but I'm always sort of checking, okay, where's where is my beam? So here I'm like out of the beam, here I'm in the beam. So I know I want to be here. And then the other thing that I didn't talk about in the first session is what I find the best thing to do is, and what Lightbridge actually recommends as well, is handhold uh, the reflector first. You know, I work with a lot of technicians and assistants who will just immediately go grab a C-stand, immediately go grab the rigging hardware. But it's, I find it so much um, more enjoyable, A, and two, more efficient, uh, to sort of handhold the reflector and kind of find what you're trying to do first because it's so much faster just to take it in your hand and manipulate it and kind of find where you want it and then once you're kind of happy with where it is you know I'll make a mental note of what the you know what angle the reflector is in and then I'll know just based on kind of where the baby pin has to be how to put the c-stand so so again, so uh, talking again about multiple reflectors in the same beam, starting with a number three, 25 by 25, aperture 120D, spotlight 26 degree barrel, 
now taking a number one, seven by seven, and I really like these seven by sevens for tabletop. Again, I'm looking to zone the light, so I'm looking generally for smaller splashes of light. So the, the smaller the reflector, the less spread it has, and you know, the more ability that I have to sort of create these smaller splashes. And so I'll take something like this and I'll be, and what I would even do is maybe I would, you know, take the number three off a little bit. Again, C stand is great because you can, once you have it set, you can just easily trim it. And then I'll take a number one and say I want, you know, I want a little bit of a harder kick here. So again, looking at where my edge of my beam is. So in this case, if I want to take something really low, you know, maybe I don't have enough light here because I'm starting to lose, lose my, actually that's pretty, still pretty good. So maybe, you know, maybe I want to do something like that on the walnuts, just something a little bit harder there. And so once I've, you know, once I've got that, I sort of look at how my reflector is in my hand and I know the mount's going to come back this way and the pin's gonna come back this way, so I kind of strategically think where's the best place to put my C stand. So I'll put, put the C wheel in. I'll grab another mount. I'll grab another C stand like this. Sling this. And this is also where it's good practice to sort of know how to manipulate a C stand. So just knowing, you know, to, to set all your legs the same direction, you know, uh, it really sets you up for success. If you just sort of place your C stands any which way, you're, go you're going to sort of struggle to kind of, you know, get it. C stands are, are designed to kind of nest together and work really close, but if you don't set the legs the same way all the time, uh, you're going to run into some uh, frustration. So again, once I have it more or less set, I'll kind of see where I want to be again. So I know I want to be kind of there. So I know I want to come back. And then if I know I'm sort of more or less in the ballpark of where I want to be, I will... What I'll do is I'll take the C stand, loosen all the carefully loosen all the the pan, the tilt on the arm, and the tilt on the head, and then kind of find it again. And then one by one, I will lock off each axis of the C stand. Generally, I'll end with the the, um, the arm, the head on the arm. And then again, once it's like locked off, but it's not quite right, I can just take the C stand and just trim it. So maybe something like that. And again, this I'm using a phone, so it's gonna auto expose a little bit. So you might, yeah, you can kind of see it a little bit there. All right, so that's kind of an example of two reflectors in the same kind of beam. And actually, let me tilt down so we can actually see that. So that's two. That's uh, two reflectors in the same beam. Uh, let me sort of see if anybody had any questions. Getting loose text loose on set with any tiny reflectors is asking for trouble. <laughs> uh, okay. Cool. So I will flip this back around. Okay. So that is, hopefully, Billy, that answered your question, if you're still here. Um, just seeing who's still here. Cool. Uh, great. Uh, so we're still here. Uh, we've got another half an hour. If anyone has any other questions or uh, wants to see anything, I know people are kind of coming and going, so hopefully I don't... Uh, miss anything. I also don't want to be redundant for people who have been here the entire time. Um, that's mainly what I wanted to cover.
in terms of my own notes. Um, we talked about um, the different parts of the system. We talked about the starter kit briefly. We talked about which Lightbridge themselves uh, are going to go live tomorrow. Um, I believe at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time is what they clarified. Uh, and they're going to be talking about the starter kit there. Um, I've talked about a little bit about rigging and how I'm rigging stuff. Again, C-Stands, uh, Matthews, six-inch collars. Uh, I've talked about the bags I'm using, which are their, uh, their Cordura-style bags. Um, we talked about uh, uh, we talked about fitting multiple uh, reflectors in the same beam. In the case of the Lico, I haven't talked about the Dado yet with the PB adapter. If anyone's kind of curious about that, um, we can kind of look at that and maybe the differences with that. Uh, Hugh asks, how is quarantine going for me? Quarantine has been fine uh, for the most part. Um, it's a bit of a bummer that we're all out of work at the moment and that production is shut down. Um, but, uh, you know, there's, uh, not a whole lot we can do about that. And, uh, at this point, I think, uh, you know, it's all about, uh, safety and making sure that everyone is healthy and safe first and hopefully production will, uh, return, uh, shortly. Um, Pizza, uh, pizza warmer bags work too, is what Adam says. Uh, that's true. Okay, I guess, you know, whatever kind of whatever works for you uh, gets the job done. Um, I like the Cordura bags. Um, the only note I would say is I, I would hope, I kind of, I wish that the, uh, not so much, the, certain, uh, the 25 by is probably the biggest culprit, is the, the slack between the slot is a little bit, uh, loose. So what I've found is sometimes people won't notice that they're putting a reflector into a spot that already has a reflector. And uh, the back, um, this back uh, dovetail piece will sometimes scratch the face of the one in front of it. Um, and so I wish if I had any note, uh, if Lightbridge is here, I don't know if they're here anymore. Uh, I would say if you guys can make that slot a little bit tighter, not to the point where you struggle to get an in and out, um, that would be cool. Uh, so there's a question, can you explain the benefits or reason you use the system over diffused lights or bounces? Is it because of the smaller size or less light fixtures? Um, so, you know, while the principle is similar, uh, these reflectors definitely don't behave like traditional bounces. So if you're using styro, foam core, you know, if you're dealing with ultra bounce, muslin, griff, any kind of those um, traditional ref bounce methods, and they're, by all means, that is not an invalid way to do things. Um, the benefit of uh, using stuff like that is, is size. So if you're looking for something very soft, um, uh, in, you know, very soft, so you're going to like a 12 by, 8 by, even a 6 by, going really big 20 by, that's going to have a different quality. Um, and there's certainly reasons to, to still use that stuff. Um, but I'm using... I'm using these reflectors to mainly use it, you know, to create hard sunlight effects. Um, one thing I didn't sort of touch upon is the system's ab ability to, and not even the system, but just the principle of, of reflected light is that it cheats the square law. Um, and so the square law says that if you half the amount, uh, well, I don't get this wrong. If you half the amount of distance between the light and your subject, you're getting roughly four times more output. So in tabletop, that's less critical because I'm not having an object or a person moving further and, you know, or closer away, uh, to the light. Um, 
because an example in, in, in sort of in, in, you know, an example of that, uh, you can like with an actor, if you have an actor, if you have a light and you have an actor walk towards that light and that light is not, you know, very, very far away. That's if you're in a room or something and you're lighting an actor and that light is eight feet away or 10 feet away or six feet away. If that actor moves towards that light, they're going to start to burn up. They're going to, the, ex the exposure change is going to be, uh, far more drastic. What these reflectors do, or the principal reflected light, not specifically these reflectors, but the principal reflected light is you can kind of mitigate some of that. Um, so it kind of gives you this impression, even aesthetically, of something that feels a little more real. Um, and so that's kind of why I'm using the, the, the reflectors mainly for what I'm, for the context of what I'm doing is, is really a quality thing. Um, so he says, so working in tight spaces, you can extend the throw of the light artificially. Yes. So that's basically what you can do if you're, if you're kind of, you know, setting it up correctly, if you will, you know, so if you, if you have a reflect, if you have a surface that you're lighting a reflector here and the lamp here, you're not really doing anything to increase that distance. You're not taking advantage of being able to use, um, uh, taking advantage of being able to create a virtual light source. So, you know, when I'm setting stuff up, uh, and again, the application between shooting situational things on location versus tabletop, I, I take a different approach slightly. Um, with tabletop, you know, I'm not so worried about fall off um, and to get maximum output of the, of the light, uh, or the reflector, um, I'm putting the reflectors pretty close to the surfaces I'm shooting in, and then I'm and I'm backing the light out, you know, fairly far. A to increase the beam so that I can fit more stuff. Because the further away I move the light, the more spread I get out of that light, so I can put more reflectors into it. Um, and again, important. This is also important why light source matters because with a Leco you can afford to do that you can afford to back it up and still maintain a healthy amount of foot candles to where you're putting the reflectors into. Um, so I'm doing more of that. So, and versus, uh, where am I going with this? Yeah. So basically, yeah, that's, that's kind of what I'm doing. And then with shooting on location with like interviews or something like that, I'm kind of parking the light, you know, where I can park it. That's outside of the frame. If I can, you know, I'm always trying to think if I can increase um, the distance, if I can increase the distance from the, from the lamp to the reflector, the reflector to the subject, the more real it's going to be. So that's still kind of the goal. Um, but yeah, if you're working in tight spaces, you know, you can, you can sort of make it feel uh, like the light is coming from a lot further away than it actually is. Um, Sorry for the long tangent. Uh, so, light bridge bags have been improved already, but it's still good to put the C reflector face to face or rail to rail. Right. Yes. Um, that is a good way to do it. Um, yeah, it's, it's more just to mitigate. Um, you know, I'm fairly careful, but sometimes you just have technicians that are just not as careful, and it's just going to happen where, you know, you have a bunch of. Um, a bunch of stuff. Uh, you kind of have, you know, some reflectors in here already, and they just happen to sort of take one, and they don't sort of check, and then they just like jam it into a spot that already has a reflector. Um, I find that uh, I've had a couple reflectors just have that sort of two notches of scratches uh, that uh, where the dovetail scratches the other surface. But anyways, it's great to know that. Uh, you guys are thinking about that. Um, can you share the live session to watch after? I just switched it on and I'm curious about the rest. Cool. Yes, I will share uh, the the first session that I did between 3 and 4 p.m. should be up already, or it's probably being encoded by Instagram right now, so that will hopefully be up. Um, and then this session that I just did now, which is going to be for another 25 minutes, I will share as well. So, Chris, no worries about that. Uh, 
Den Boulay asks, what are they made from? Um, it is, as I understand it, it's a uh, polished aluminum surface. So it's a, it's a fairly soft grade aluminum. I think just by the nature of to get the surface that way, it, they had to use a certain grade of aluminum. Um, and I think Lightbridge is actually here in the room within the chat, so maybe they can elaborate on it further. But it, it is an aluminum, um, except for the number four. I think the number four, which is like a real soft, uh, kind of soft matte kind of finish. This is some other kind of surface. I don't know what they used it, what this is made out of, but this is this is non-aluminum, or certainly the the immediate surface is not aluminum. Uh, So when's the starter kit group by? Uh, funny enough, I thought about that. Um, I know a lot of people in the room here are from Toronto. So uh, that's something that uh, we can uh, definitely sideline a discussion about if there's enough people here in Toronto that are interested in the system. Um, maybe we can get together and, and put together uh, an order. Um, hopefully once this... Um, quarantine is over, personally, I would really like to do an event here in Toronto, um, like a bit of a demo day. So um, that's something that I would like to coordinate um, once all this madness in the world is over and we can sort of get together again. So stay tuned for that. Hopefully that's something I can work towards. Um, the newer versions of the bags are more padded. Keep Yes, awesome. That's cool. Uh, great. So we still have 22 people here, roughly. Um, we're hanging out here for another 20 minutes or so. Uh, if anyone has any questions or would like to see anything else, um, happy to answer your questions. Uh, anyone out there is also, at any given time, is more than welcome to DM me and ask me further questions if you sort of think of something after this. Um, and uh, I can happily answer your question directly. Um, also, if you haven't poked around on my Instagram, uh, I have a couple. I've been doing, the start of this year, I started doing more uh, set breakdowns, uh, largely inspired by a cinematographer by the name of Ian Murray, who's in the UK. Um, I think I saw the Reflectric guys here as well at some point. There are uh, two guys in the UK as well that have a, like a truck that is kind of specializing in reflected re light. Uh, and uh, those guys are doing a lot of interesting stuff with reflected light as well. So, um, so if you're interested more in uh, CRLS uh, and reflected light, I would definitely check out those two guys on Instagram. Um, but sorry, yeah, uh, back to that. I've been doing sort of set breakdowns more this year as much as I can. And because this has become such a staple um, in my work, most of the breakdowns I've been doing um, have some usage of the reflector. So feel free to check that out um, and uh, see how I've been using it. Um, Cool. So yeah, so it seems like there's a lot of interest here locally, which is awesome. So yeah, I would definitely, once again, when this um, quarantine ends, I will definitely look over to, uh, to coordinating some locally. Um, cool. So Judith is also here from Lightbridge. Uh, I want to plug that they are doing a, a live stream tomorrow at, I believe, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And they're going to be talking about the starter kit. So that is something that I utilized to get into the system. I, I bought the starter kit, uh, which is Diffusions 1, 2, 3, 4 in the 15 by sizes and number 3 and number 4 in the 25 by sizes and two mounts. And they just kind of ship it in this cardboard box. And uh, it's like five ninety five US, so pretty cost effective, I would say, um, just to kind of get started. Uh, how does the output of the Dado PB compare to the 120D2 and 26? Uh, great question. 
Um, I'm not too sure, but we can look at that for sure. I've got a meter here as well. If anyone wants to start doing light readings, we can start looking at that. Um, so uh, right now I've got the 120D on at 100% with the 26 on. I can flip over to the dado. This is a DLED3. Let me go grab that. So I've also got, so this is the, uh, the DLED3 Turbo. So this is a, uh, a bi-color fixture. It's a 40-watt fixture. It's actually got two 40-watt engines in it, a daylight uh, chip and a tungsten chip. But I think at, only, at any given time, I think it's only using 40 watts and it's blending between the two. Um, you can run it off DC. It'll, it'll take a DTAP source or an XLR source, run it off AC as well. Um, and then on, a, on the front of this is a, um, a, a parallel beam adapter. Um, so what this does is it's an additional optic that just slides into the accessory slot where your barn doors or projector lens would otherwise go. Um, and this essentially if, um, increases the output of the light. It intensifies all the light, uh, gathers it in this, in this optic, and then sends it out as a very, very spotty uh, source. Um, so combined with the reflectors, it becomes incredibly uh, efficient. Like you get a tremendous amount of output out of this tiny little light into when it goes to a reflector, or even just straight. But it's, it's almost, it's too spotty basically to really use straight so it's really meant to go into the into into a reflector um so you get a lot of output out of it um the downside if if you will is that it is very very spotty so you know um you know in order to get the same kind of beam spread that you would get out of the aperture you would have to t back this thing up so far that it would be impractical so if you're doing single reflector or maybe a smaller reflector and, and like a 15 by and maybe like catching them like a seven centimeter into it as well. Like that's kind of the limitations from a practical working standpoint I have found uh, for this. You know, once if you're trying to put like five, six reflectors into it, you, you just can't. It's, it's just so spotty. Um, the, the benefits are that it is tiny. So compared to the aperture, it's like a third of the size. Um, it's a little more expensive for sure. Uh, it's bicolor, so the aperture is, is only daylight, um, although they do have a bicolor 300D coming, so that sort of changes things as well. Um, you know, for me, it's like uh, about finding the best tools, um, and so I'm not particularly, I'm, I'm, I would say I'm pretty brand agnostic. So, you know, I, I, I like this, I've been using this uh, more recently to, to light my in interviews i'm lighting sort of my mid ground and my subjects with this stuff in terms of hair light cross light and then i'm really using the aperture with its bigger beam spread and probably going to a 300d at that point for my backgrounds um more than a 300d so yeah so let's look at output so i will connect everything here What, what time is it now? 15 minutes, okay. Hopefully I don't lose you guys again. So we'll get this guy plugged in. Okay, so we've got the data plug in. I'm going to flip this around. Uh, Lightbridge asked, "Did I ever use? The, did I ever try the BBNS compact beams?" I did try. I did test briefly the BBNS compact beam. Uh, Justin Lovell, who is another DP here in Toronto, had one, and he kindly lent me his for a couple of days. Um, I tried it. I had the seven degree version, I believe. I didn't love it, truth be told. Um, it did a good job. It's priced really well. You can run it on a battery. 
it's very con it's very small so if, if you're traveling a lot i think it's it could be really great um as an owner operator i'm typically looking for tools that serve multiple functions i guess like i'd rather spend a little more money and find something that is i can multi-purpose for different reasons um it's kind of why i like the aperture stuff uh with all the modifiers that they have for their lamps I like the dado just because it's bi color. Um, you know, they have the the uh, the global projector and the uh, fixed shutter projector as well for tabletop stuff. That's really great. So I decided to go with dado. Uh, I know Toby was announcing that they're doing a bi color version of the uh, compact beam. So I'd be kind of curious to maybe look at that again when that becomes available. But um, yeah, I, uh, I did test it and I just, I didn't, I didn't love it. Um, so I kind of passed. Hey, Justin is here. I, I thought I saw him here. Okay, so getting sidetracked again, we will look at DLED3 turbo with PB intensifier and app versus aperture 122 uh, with 26 degree spotlight. So uh, let me flip this around. Uh, so there's a question here about, oh, so the question here about uh, the Godox LEDs, which seem to be a lot like the, uh, the Dados. Um, yeah, I'm aware of the Godox stuff. Um, I'm aware of the Godox stuff, but um, I haven't seen it per in person. Um, you know, I think there are a lot of fixtures, you know, coming out of China and other places now that are really great and the quality is definitely getting better. Um, you know, I think Dado, there's a certain kind of optic and quality of optic that those guys still do very well and better than anyone else. And uh, certainly some of the um, uh, off-brand stuff is getting better. Um, so... Um, I'd be interested to sort of see it, but I, I haven't sort of tested it myself. Uh, okay, great. So here we are. So we're going back. So here's, this is the, this is the 26 degree right now. And the other benefit I would say about Alicos is that, you know, in this case I have, you can see, you know, I have a lot of beam uh, around the reflector. So in, in this specific case, if I knew that this was gonna be it and I wasn't gonna put a lot more reflectors into this, maybe I would flip to the 19 degree. But although in truth, I would probably stay with the 26 just to give me some flexibility because I've got all that extra space around that reflector to put other reflectors into if I need to all of a sudden. And as you can see, the the evenness of the beam is is, the, the feel of the beam is, is quite even. So, you know, uh, you don't have to be smack in the center of that beam to get the, you know, to get the optimal aim on your reflector. Um, but what's nice about the Lico, in this case, I it's, you know, being sh shown Sean into the f black floppies. Um, so not really producing a lot of extra fill light, but if that were like a white wall behind that reflector or something, you know, with a lot more bounce potential. What's great about it, the Lico is that you can cut it. So I could, I could just, you know, take down, kind of take down what I don't want. And now, you know, I can control my fill light. Sometimes you actually want that fill light, uh, but lot, in some cases you don't. So having something like a Lico that's got the cutability and the blades, internal blades, um, really helped to control that. Uh, yes, yeah, uh, Andrew Locke, who runs Gaffer and Gear, fantastic YouTube channel, if you guys haven't checked it out, uh, he does do a comparison between the Godox and the Dado, um, but, yeah, the one thing is they don't, Godox doesn't make a parallel beam intensifier, and I don't know whether Dado's stuff will work with the Godox, arguably yes, but depending on the optics, it, it may or may not line up. Um, okay, so going back to this, we'll open this back up again. So that's the 26. You can sort of see on the tabletop on the bottom kind of the difference here. 
Okay, now we will flip to the dado. So I'm going to kill this. So here is, that is the dado with the PB intensifier. So you can already see, you can already see it's way punchier or way spottier. So, so much so that I, as you can see that number, that seven by seven um, number one that I was able to fit into the beam of the aperture spotlight, I can't with the dado. Um, so either why, so in this case, I either have to m move that seven by into probably where that 25 by is or get another lamp or, or whatever. So, um, there are, you know, pros and cons. So again, you know, not, uh, it's a sort of different tool. Uh, but as you can also see, if I flip this around, uh, or do this, you can see the, the size difference. So the dado is uh, much more compact, and uh, it's actually quite remarkable how much uh, how much punch you get out of that tiny little lamp, forty watt lamp, uh, with the PB intensifier. So let's go. We can go and take some light readings here, and just to sort of see. So we'll set that again. Uh, I will grab a light meter. So, so this is what, so the dado at full, make sure I'm fully up on my dimmer. Okay. Uh, well, okay. We'll go to, we'll go to full daylight on the dado. The color match might not be the same. I can actually break up my color meter and get the two fixtures that at least match the color. Cause you, you might be getting a little less out of the dado in uh, full daylight, which is probably I think it's 6,000 Kelvin. So that's, that's a 22 and a half at 800, 24 frames a second, 180. 22 and a half. Um, if I go to the aperture, it's a little, little warmer for sure. I'm getting 16, 16 and a half. So as a direct transmission at, at the surface of the reflector, it's about a one stop difference. Uh, now in terms of the returning light off the reflector, we can also look at that. So to be fair, I'm going to pan off that seven by seven because that doesn't contribute to the scene when I use the dado. Double check the aim here. Okay, so so that's just a hair over a uh, hair over eight. Now we flip to the dado. Also, you gotta again make sure that your angle of incidence is kind of correct, so you're getting the most out of the fixture. Also, I I'm trying my best to make sure that the front element of both lamps line up the same, so it's kind of a fair fight. So that's probably about right. So what did I say? Eight. Interesting. So the dado's returning light is lower. It's like five, five, six, and a, but just over five, six. So it's about a stop difference there. 
Now, the reason I, the reason that is actually is if you, it's hard to see on this camera, but if you look at the dado, there is some feathering that's happening in that 25 by. So it's actually not filling up edge to edge as much as the aperture is. So that's probably why we're seeing less output. Um, we're seeing less output in the final scene off of the reflector than we are directly at the reflector, if that makes any sense. And if I tweak the out, like that's probably better now. So I'll probably get more out of it. So to be fair, to give it a fair fight, you need a bit of a re-aim here. So we'll try that now. So yeah, there we go. Now I'm getting, now I'm getting an eight even. So now I'm getting the same as the aperture. So the dado just needed a little bit more um, caressing to make sure that um, it was being filled up completely. Um, and that is sort of the, you know, the spottier the light is in the case of the dado, you have to take a little bit more care in where you're positioning it and where you're aiming it to really filling out and also not um, having, uh, having the expectation correct, you know, having, you know, not false expectations, you know, you could take, you know, so for example, this dado uh, is never going to fill up a 50 by effectively. I mean, you could back out the dado to a certain point where it will, but you know, you know, working distance, practical working distance kind of scenario, you're not going to fill out a 50 by. So just having that kind of realistic expectation. Um, uh, but yeah, so just taking a little bit more care when the light's spottier, whether it's a dado, whether it's the compact beam from BBNS, you know, the spottier that light is, yes, you get a lot more foot candles in that surface, but you got to be a little bit more careful how you aim that and where you put your lamp and all that kind of stuff. Um, where something like the Leco is, for the lack of a better term, a little more dummy proof because it's got a wider beam, it's a little bit more even edge to edge. You're maybe not getting as much output as you can um, comparatively. Like, like again, we look at the data and we look at the uh, aperture. The data is was a stop brighter, I think, right? Um, so, you know, it just you know you you you, know, you never get anything for free. You kind of have to always weigh the pros and cons of different systems. Um, Yes, for travel, the dado makes sense, but it's more pricey. Yes, the, you know, the, I will admit the dado stuff isn't cheap, um, but to, for me anyway, I, I've you know ha I haven't really seen uh, anything else that kind of comes close optically. And again, as a you know, to just to preface, I am an owner operator. I have my own truck uh, and stuff, um, so I'm always looking for tools that are can do a, a bunch of different things. You know, so much of my gear purchasing decisions now are, are based purely on space. Like, can I fit it in my truck, you know? Um, and so I need to be able to fit tools that I either I'm using or all the time and or can do a bunch of different things. Um, you know, one trick pony stuff, just, I just don't have space for it. Um, DLE three into 15 by into a 50 by might work. Yes. Yeah. I haven't tried the double bounce thing, Tom, in terms of using another reflector to increase the spread to get into a 50 by. So that is something you can absolutely try to do um, for sure. So um, and it, yeah, DLD7 is twice the power of DLD3. So yes, I I did consider buying a DLD7, but the Turbo 7 is almost twice the price as the DLD3. Um, so for me, doing a lot of tabletop work, I, I made the decision in my head that it made more sense possibly to get two Turbo 3s than it did to get one Turbo 7. That being said, I probably will add a Turbo 7 at some point. Um, but with limited budget, um, yeah, getting two, getting two Turbo 3s made more, more sense. Uh, cool. So this is about to end, guys. I think it's about five o'clock now. Um, is th if there's anyone here that's still interested to continue the conversation, let me know. I can I can start a third session. I'm happy to hang out some some more, but let me know. 
um, before this ends, thank you guys for joining me either on this session or uh, the previous session that I ran from three to four. Both sessions will be going up online uh, on my story stream. So if you missed it, you can tune in there. I'm going to try to personally go back and um, uh, just review some questions if I missed anything. Um, hope everyone is staying safe, staying sane out there, staying creative. Uh, I think it's important as well. So uh, hopefully, uh, maybe I'll do one of these again sometime soon. Cool, cool, cool. So I think everyone's good. Yes, thank you to the Light Bridge for joining as well. Um, I'm sorry that I didn't get to acknowledge more people here, but thanks to everyone who who joined. Uh, please tune in to their live stream happening tomorrow. I'll definitely be there myself. Hey, guys of the Reflectric, good to see you. Um, awesome, awesome. Cool. So I uh, probably will just let this run out until it ends itself. But uh, again, thanks for joining. Thanks for uh, listening. Hopefully I didn't uh, ramble incessantly. Awesome, awesome. Let's see, I'm just seeing if I missed anything here. Yes, uh, we talked about maybe doing a demo day here in Toronto at some point. That is something I will add to my to-do list, so uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, Cool, cool, cool. All right. Well, I think everyone's starting to check out here. Um, so on that note, I will end that. Uh, again, thanks for tuning in. And um, everyone stay safe out there. And uh, we will talk to you very soon. All right. Ciao. Bye.